Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on distributed PI planning and management with JIRA. Um, just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. As you may have noticed, all attendees are muted. So feel free to, to yell at the screen if you disagree with us on something, we won't be able to hear you. Um, please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions. We have a dedicated time at the end to answer any of them. So by all means, as they come up, just fire them away and we'll get to as many as we can in the QA session afterwards. Um, for those of you who are um, unable to watch the whole thing, the webinar is gonna be recorded and we'll send out a link afterwards where you can watch the recording. So if you need to leave halfway through or you're gonna miss a section, that's not a problem. You'll be able to watch it later again. That said, let me quickly introduce uh, everyone here today. So. Speaker number one is me. I'm Phil Haykoop. I'm the solutions engineer here at ALM Works. I'm also SBC certified and I'm in charge of kind of our safe initiative. Um, next to me is Alexis. She'll be curating and moderating the Q&A session that we have at the end. And speaker number two with us is Tegan. She's from Easy Agile. She's the product manager there. And uh, she's going to be talking about how you can do a lot of the cool stuff with Easy Agile programs. Um, that brings me to a quick overview of what we're going to discuss today. Um, first, we'll set the scene real quick with some definitions and explaining um, what SAFE is and what PI planning is and some of the challenges that go with that. And after that, we're also going to discuss some of the post PI planning management things. So once you've finished your PI planning, what then? Um, we're going to discuss both the post PI planning and some of the pre-PI planning stuff that kind of all rolls into one as it's supposed to be a nice little cadence that repeats itself. So uh, before we dive in, just some quick definitions. So as most of you may know, SAFE stands for the Scaled Agile Framework. It's one of a number of frameworks for applying agile processes to larger organizations. Uh, PI stands for the Program Increment. Uh, that's a fixed time box for building and validating a full system increment where you can demonstrate value and get fast feedback. And the ART is the agile release train, which is a cross-functional team of teams. They're usually aligned along value streams and they work together to reach defined goals. Um, those are terms that we're going to be throwing around. So we wanted to define them before we started. Uh, that having been said, I'd like to hand it over to Tegan, who will uh, tell us a little bit about Scaled Agile and planning. Thanks, Phil. And hello, everybody. Um, from wherever you're, you're coming from, I'm actually coming to you live today from warm and sunny Stuttgart, which is in the south of Germany. But you can probably tell by my accent that I'm not a native German. I'm actually from Australia. So... I'll be looking forward to going home um, tomorrow. But to get us started, um, I'm going to start the exploration into SAFE and, and PI planning by taking you on a little bit of a, um, a journey, well, Easy Agile's journey to scaled planning. And this kind of started 14 months ago. So up until the beginning of this year, we had two apps on the Atlassian Marketplace, um, Easy Agile User Story Maps and Easy Agile Roadmaps. And what we were hearing uh, a lot from our larger story mapping and road mapping customers was that while those apps were great at the team level, so in terms of like executing and, and planning the day-to-day -day work for an individual team, they lacked that visibility into the work that multiple teams across their organization were doing. And that's what spurred this investigation into scaled planning. And we, we started this off with um, some customer interviews. So I wanted to share some of the key themes that we identified during those interviews. So on the screen, you can see some of the, the key themes that we, we started to pick up on um, in our initial conversations with those larger story mapping and road mapping customers. And I've summarized kind of the, the main three for you here when it came to the challenges of not just scaling um, their planning, but also doing that in JIRA. So the first that was um, super evident was this idea of cross-team visibility. And the companies that we were talking to, they were super interested in visualizing the work that multiple teams were doing um, at any given moment. Next, um, 
and probably the most prominent thing that we picked up on in our conversations with customers was the importance that understanding um, cross-team dependencies was to either the success or failure of a program or a project. And our customers were telling us that it was really difficult for those dependency relationships to be visualized um, and, and brought to the surface in JIRA. And the third thing that we heard kind of time and time uh, again from our companies that were using our products were that they were pulling on frameworks to help them scale the success they had uh, with Agile at the team level across the entire organization. But the biggest challenge um, about the adoption of frameworks was that they didn't know how that those frameworks would work within the confines of JIRA. And uh, I guess based on, on the title of, of the webinar and, and Phil's descriptions, we're gonna focus specifically on the SAFE framework, so the Scaled Agile framework. And if you're familiar with SAFE, one thing that you're probably aware of is that it's a fairly large um, and robust framework in its entirety. So we were hearing from customers that they were adopting just one aspect um, from the Scaled Agile framework, and that was program increment planning. And I'm gonna to refer to it from now on as PI planning. It's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, that's, that's what it stands for. And so we're gonna take just a few minutes to talk about what PI planning actually is and what some of the objectives and outcomes of participating in this type of planning are. So at a very, um, High level PI planning is a two day event, which sees uh, all members from an agile release train. So if you remember Phil's definition, that's kind of a, um, a, a team of teams cross-functional group. Um, and they come together to plan out their next program increment. And a program increment for many um, might be a quarter, or if you're uh, more prescriptive to the way that SAFE defines a PI, it's probably 10 weeks worth of work. And so what will happen um, in this PI planning session is that a product manager will kind of set the vision in the shape of top upcoming features uh, for the next increment of work. And then they ask the teams within their program to identify and plan the work that they need to do to help support the achievement of the features that they've set out. Um, once each team has gone away and, and they've identified what they need to do to help uh, the success of that feature, They'll go and talk with the product owners and other um, developers from other teams to identify cross team dependencies. And the way that those dependencies are communicated to the rest of the um, Agile release train is kind of like what you're seeing in the image on the screen. It's using those pieces of physical string um, to tie one issue to another to represent that a dependency is taking place. So that's kind of like a really high level um, idea of what PI planning is and kind of what the objectives for participating in that kind of planning are. Of course, um, there are some challenges with running a physical PI planning session. Probably the, the most obvious is the expense associated with this um, activity. So we want, you know, every, ideally every member of our Agile release train to be physical present physically present in one location for a PI planning session. And an agile release train can be anywhere up from 100 to 150 people and you're flying in um, that amount of people into a single location that can hold an event of that scale, um, as well as accommodating those people for at least two or three days. And a, a PI planning session isn't just a one-time thing, um, it might happen four or five times a year, so it becomes quite a costly um, exercise. The second is that it's really difficult to communicate the value of uh, the PI planning session or the plan even to members of an agile release train who might not have been able to attend the session. So as I mentioned just before, it is quite a costly event. And so not in, in all, most cases that I've heard, um, not every member of an agile release train is sent to PI planning. And so we, we of course have some of those people who miss out on the value of that physical session. And the third as well is it's really hard to track progress after you've completed a planning session. Um, we might be six weeks into, into the program increment and that physical program board that we put together six weeks ago um, is in an office on the other side of the world. And so I really struggle to get insight into how will I know when we complete what we committed to, you know, six, eight, ten weeks ago. So... Understanding that this problem 
existed and our larger customers were really challenged by doing this planning session physically. Um, at Easy Agile, we built a product called Easy Agile Programs. And our goal with Easy Agile Programs is to help teams with distributed planning at scale. And we wanted to help them do that by making something that was native for JIRA and that enabled better cross-team visibility and dependency visualization. So we're going to move on now. What we're going to do is walk through the standard uh, two-day PI planning agenda. And this has been prescribed by the, um, the folks at the Scaled Agile Framework. And we're going to look at how each task is managed in a physical planning session and then what a digital alternative might look like using Easy Agile programs and JIRA. So the first is this idea around business context. And so to start an event, um, a PI planning event, typically a business owner will stand in front of a room, uh, in front of the room of the 100 to 150 members of the art, and they'll give a presentation on the current state of the business and they'll present perspective on how well existing solutions are addressing current customer needs. So if we were to digitize this in Easy Agile programs, um, ideally what could be done is a business owner could share a recorded video or even the slides from their presentation with all members of the art by linking to a confluence page, uh, just as an example, in the program details section of Easy Agile programs. And by doing it this way, um, the presentation then becomes, uh, it's not restricted to team members who are physically present during planning. And it's also something that can be referred to throughout the entirety of the, the planning session and the execution as well. Then we move on to the idea of a product or solution vision um, and also the architecture vision. And this is something that I mentioned a little bit earlier um, in today's session where a product manager will present the top 10 upcoming features um, to a program. So we'll see how this is, this typically looks in a physical session. So this is kind of the list like uh, approach that, that many take in the presentation that they give to their agile release train. And this is representing uh, the top 10 features that, that have been kind of um, assigned to the next program increment. And I've taken this image straight from the safe guidebook around what this part of the session should look like. And it's not particularly inspiring. Um, and so we hope to kind of, kind of bring this to life in Easy Agile programs. So rather than presenting the top 10 features in a list-like presentation, um, program managers are able to schedule their, their features, which is what um, an EPIC is referred to in SAFE. In Easy Agile programs, this can be an EPIC, this can be a custom issue type, um, and they're allowed to schedule that onto a visual timeline for the duration of an increment. And it ensures that all the teams are aligned on the committed features um, for the increment and it provides visibility into the direction of the program for all the stakeholders. And so what we're seeing is we're using real data um, to set the program vision. And rather than using a PowerPoint presentation, this is kind of the single source of truth. Um, we can tie this back to, to our JIRA issues. So next, and probably the most important part of a PI planning session is the concept of team breakouts. So we'll look, see what this looks like in a physical uh, planning session. So in, in the breakout, um, this is where teams work individually to estimate, estimate the capacity for each of their sprints in the program. Um, this is where the teams will come together to identify any new or existing issues from their backlog that they need to plan out to help achieve the set features. And they typically, this is all typically done pretty physically, so using post-it notes, for example, and each team's draft plan will be stuck on a wall for all of the Agile release train to see, very much like what you're seeing in the image on the screen. And then after we've identified what we need to do for feature completion, we'll identify the dependencies um, between our team and other teams within our program. And we'll depict these using pieces of string um, literally stuck from one issue to the other to the rest of the program. So in Easy Agile programs, each team has their own team planning board. 
Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of, of the team breakouts, product owners and their teams need to set the capacity for each of the sprint within their program increments. And you can see pretty easily um, here that, that a product owner is able to do that with inline edit. We do have the desire to pull in, eventually pull in um, a team's historical velocity and then obviously give them the ability to, to inline edit that based on capacity. You know, team members are out of the office, team members are on holiday. It obviously affects our capacity, but for now um, it's, it's an inline edit function. So with the context of the feature roadmap at the top of each team's team planning board, um, teams are able to pull in existing issues from their backlog or create new issues within the planning board uh, to support those feature completion. So by selecting a feature on the roadmap at the top, like what I've done and creating a new issue, what I've actually done is I've automatically created that, that uh, epic link to those issues. And if I select a feature with the backlog panel open, it will also filter down my backlog by what issues um, are linked to that particular epic. And then it comes time to um, identify and create our dependencies on other teams. So in the physical session, we saw that this is typically done with pieces of string. Um, in Easy Agile programs, we have a drag and drop heuristic uh, that we use to create and visualize cross team dependencies. So dragging an issue from one team on top of another, uh, it not only visualizes the dependency, but it also creates the uh, JIRA issue link on, on each of the tickets. And you could do this in the typical JIRA backlog uh, fashion as well. If you wanted to create the issue link that way, the line would also appear here in each of the team's planning board. And then finally, um, each team's draft plan is visible to the entire Agile release train in the increment overview. Um, so this is kind of like a, a digital version of that program board you've seen in a few of the slides so far. So it's really the ability for teams to facilitate that cross team planning and the dependency management allows distributed team members to participate um, in a PI planning session as well. And so, um, digitizing this limits double handling of information, which is someone at the end of every physical PI planning session has to pull off those post-it notes from the wall and enter them into JIRA as JIRA issues. And this also means that we can track progress towards feature completion in real time. And we move on to the draft plan review and um, any plan reworks that need to be done to the estimation, uh, resources or stories. So if we can see what this looks like in a physical session, this is pretty laborious, particularly if um, there are a lot of adjustments needed to be made. It's pulling off post-it notes, writing new post-it notes, changing um, string locations to represent dependencies. It's all done pretty physically and it means that any digitization of this process, um, putting things into JIRA, really can't be made until the very end of the second day of PI planning, which means that those team members who aren't physically present are kind of in the dark completely for two days. So in PI, um, in Easy Agile programs, we include the ability for inline editing um, of issue summaries and um, estimates as well. So all changes made to the issues in Easy Agile programs are reflected in uh, the JIRA Agile board automatically. And this just makes for really quick and simple um, rework of any rework that needs to be done. And with that, that's kind of the, the process from, from start to finish of a PI planning session and what a, a digital version might look like leveraging programs and JIRA. And now I'll give it over to Phil to show what, what happens after the PI planning session and how do we actually go about tracking um, our progress toward feature completion. All right, thank you, Tegan. Um, so as you can see, um, once you finish your PI planning session, whether it's distributed or uh, everyone in, in one big room, um, you now have your planning board. You, you have to, you've all agreed on this is the work that we're going to be doing on this, this program increment. And now you actually need to go and execute and go back to your teams and, and do the work. And um, 
Oftentimes, this is also where the rubber meets the road. So you'll actually see um, times where your plans that you made originally are going to be running into issues. You'll need to update information again. And uh, structure is a great way to organize a lot of this information. And using the rules, you can actually use your JIRA database, which is where all this information lives. And you can visualize it in a number of different ways. So for example, you could group them by sprints that you've planned. And then you can visualize um, which item goes where. And if you drag and drop an item to a new sprint, for example, on your structure board, uh, it'll reflect that change all the way into your Easy Agile program board as well. Because all this information lives in your JIRA database. Um, interacting with it in one program uh, updates it in the other automatically. So we're always looking at a single source of truth, which is why these two programs work so well together. Um, and so when you do your sprint planning afterwards and you're breaking down these features, um, if you update the story point count for something or the weightest shortest job factor or you know add more dependencies, these new information will update and will show in both places. So Structure is a great place to do this. It's a great way to look at all these information and you can add columns and remove columns to show exactly the information you want and not more, not less. And it's a great way to also um, keep everything in one place and then do the inline editing because structure also offers that. So if you add a column for story points, you can add inline edit that. You can add a column for status and inline edit that. And you can define how you, you have progress. So in this case, progress is tied to the status, but you could have progress tied to um, other fields or comments or any kind of other kind of update that needs to be performed. So structure is, is non-prescriptive. So it's a great way to actually bend the tool to the way you guys do work and have decided to, to do a lot of this. Um, and so when you drill down into details, that's a great way to kind of update a lot of this information so you can see blocking links, but it also allows you to do the actual scheduling of work. And we have what's called an agile Gantt chart, which uh, I know sounds a bit like a contradiction in terms, but the Gantt chart calculates um, where things go based on the information that you've set it. So as you update information, the Gantt chart will also update everything downstream. So in this case, we schedule things by, uh, by sprint and therefore the sprints will also show up in the Gantt chart as you can see. So you've got the sprint one and sprint two, but also for future sprints that haven't yet been scheduled will also be showing up on the calendar. So you can actually start dragging and dropping and moving items to where you think they will happen. So if you have um, three sprints in a, in a PI or four, you can reflect that in your Gantt chart and use this for reporting. It's a great way to kind of have a visual tool Everyone can see who's working on what, what the status is, and you can also use this to share this information. So team A has this particular Gantt chart and this resource overview, and we can see who's over allocated and not. But at the same time, you don't need to limit this view to team A. You can actually share this information with um, uh, team B and team C and all the way down to, to team Z and whoever else is out there. So you can see what information what other teams are working on and get a feel for when, for example, a blocker is scheduled to be worked on. So that kind of information allows different teams to actually update their plans based on what everyone else is doing. Cause it's really important and it's, it's kind of very agile. Um, the teams are empowered to make a lot of these decisions. So as this information is in Jira and whether you're working with scrum or Kanban or whatever it is that your teams end up doing, the information can be visualized, whether it's for your own team or another team and shared. And using that, you can actually give people the best opportunity to make a lot of decisions, avoid problems before they become problems, things like that. And not only does this happen on the team level, but we can actually do a lot of this on the big picture level as well. We can roll up a lot of this information from the stories and even the subtasks all the way up to past the PI level if we want to. So we can actually have the initiatives, the strategic themes, uh, the strategies, they can all end up on a single board. So you can look past the PI if you want or just at the scope of your PI. And using the ability to, to script fields, use formulas, um, add visualizations like the health in this particular case with emojis, 
um, you can add a lot of information and use that to show what the current status of the project is. And whether this is information that you want at the team level or at the portfolio level or all the way up the top to the C level that you need to be reporting to, um, because the information is the real time status of everything in your JIRA database, you have basically where things stand today. It's not a snapshot from yesterday, last week, or when someone last exported things to an Excel sheet. Um, this is real time data. So as people update, these things will update as well. Updates to budget, update, updates to time spent, current status notes, everything is, is completely uh, up to date. And using that kind of information allows people to make better decisions and it empowers the teams and empowering the team obviously allows you um, to get better information out of them to, to have them be more agile. They don't need to be managed. There's no management layer that needs to communicate between them because they have the tools at their disposal to do all that. And when you reach the end of one of these program increments, there is a dedicated sprint to inspect and adapt. And that's something we've seen done with structure as well, because structure can be tied to the confluence pages. You can dedicate a single confluence page to that particular strategy or that particular program increment. And you can use that single place to have everyone go to and update. So for example, we could use um, one of our test pro, uh, management tools to see how everything passed. You can use, um, this to manage your DevOps of the solution that comes at the end of your PI. And if something happened, if it's blocked or if it failed, then you can explain why. You can add notes and um, you can add your general inspect and adapt things. So what went well, what could have gone better? Uh, were you ready for the demo? And it's a great way to gather feedback in a central place. And because these tools are accessible to everyone, it also kind of helps uh, facilitate as opposed to forcing people to use the same tools because the advantages are all kind of baked in. It encourages people to all work through the same workflow. So everybody goes to the same process and you don't have to keep reminding people like, hey, I need you to update this, I need you to update that. And even if you do, that's immediately evident and you can actually just call on them there and you can see the updated information there. So it's a great way to kind of get an overview use all this information to gather that experience that you've, um, that you've been working through in your PI, um, share that knowledge, put it in a central place, use it to learn. And um, as you are learning about these interesting things and reviewing what went well and what didn't go very well in, in your PIs, um, you're ready to take on your next one. So now it's time to repeat. You take your inspect and adapt information you share it with everyone and you get ready for your next program increment. And hopefully uh, you failed a few times, but next time you're ready to learn from that and, and do it better. And then you get into your next program increment and repeat. Um, and that kind of brings us to the end of what it is we wanted to talk about. Um, we'll have the QA session now. So I'm gonna hand it all over to Alexis who will moderate some of the questions that have come in. Yes, uh, we have a few questions that came in. Uh, Sebastian is wondering, which JIRA issue type do you use to represent safe feature? So um, in general, we see uh, above the team level, most uh, organizations will create a new project for each level of issues or several even. And so most of the time features will end up being their own custom issue type. And that allows people to add custom workflows and, and fields that they feel are tied to it. Um, I don't know, Tegan, if you've seen different than that, but that's usually how we see it. Yeah, I've also seen um, situations where companies will use the standard JIRA EPIC um, as a feature, and there are translation kind of apps on the Atlassian marketplace that will translate the word EPIC to feature. We do know that a lot of the difficulties in adopting SAFE are actually around the language and getting on the same page. Um, but in, in Easy Agile programs, for example, that feature could be any issue type, um, as Phil said. The example I showed was just using a standard JIRA EPIC, um, but if you had any custom issue types, then you could use them to represent a feature as well. Great. Uh, we have another question. What is WSJF basic on one of the structure screens that were presented? 
So uh, WSJF, or WSJF, as some people like to say, uh, stands for Waitest Shortest Job First. Um, it's a way to prioritize the work. Um, simply speaking, it's a quantization of the biggest bang for your buck. So the most amount of value for the least amount of work. Um, and in structure in particular, we have uh, a column that showed that particular value. Uh, the, in the example I showed you, we have, uh, actually, if I'm allowed to just skip back, uh, WSGIF was the column here. You can see it's second from the right. Um, and it's a calculated column. So we have formula columns that can do calculation based on other fields. So there's an actual uh, formula that, that basically adds story points and other business value and then divides it by the scheduled amount of work. And uh, using some weighting factors, it'll give you a value. And we have one, uh, the Scaled Agile organization has a slightly different formula um, with different weighting factors and using different fields. And naturally you can completely customize it to your own needs. So it's, uh, it exists in structure more as an example in terms of like, this is how you can make one. Um, and obviously we, recommend you tailor it to your own needs if, if the, the one we have out of the box doesn't work. But it's, it's kind of uh, an attribute there and you can sort by it too. So it's an easy way to kind of see what's going on. Uh, going off of that same question, uh, was structure.testy used for the demo? It was. Uh, it was added to the big picture screen and for the inspect and adapt. Um, we So it structure.testy, for those that don't know, is a lightweight testing client. Um, and originally it, it attaches to an API from any other testing program, so whether it's from Bitbucket or anything else, and it'll show you the results. So if the build failed, it'll show failed. If it build passed, it'll show passed. Um, but we've seen a lot of people use it to manually kind of check off the status of features. So you can add different elements to it. And if I'm allowed to dash through my slides again, you can see it here on the left as the risk factor uh, value. So you can see it mitigated, blocked, medium, and low. And um, you can also see, for example, a little icon left of it is who um, updated that value. So it's a great way to kind of use it to track who signed off on work or who said there was a problem. And we use it as well here in the inspect and adapt where it's tied to the current status of the inspect and adapt, whether people have filled it in or not. And like I said, you can customize the text in there. So if you don't want green to say passed but done or approved, then that's totally up to you. Um, but it's an extension that, come, uh, that you can get. Uh, it's free on the marketplace and it integrates seamlessly with, with structure. Great. Uh, next question. How do you track changes of dates due to underlining changes on the epic or story level? Tegan, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I guess the, um, the short answer is that in easy agile programs, we don't, I, I, I guess the, the question is asking about like a, a change history so you can track um, who's changing what and when it changed. Natively in programs, we don't expose that information. I guess on the on the story level, you can see that in kind of like the change log. Um, that's a really interesting interesting question and something that um, kind of hasn't been brought up before, but I'm interested to kind of go a little bit deeper on that. I know there is another question in here around change log kind of management. So it's obviously something that's that's important and we could probably do something you know, do a better job of exposing that uh, in programs. Yeah, just to build off of that, one of the things that we've seen a lot is that um, people will have a script and they will copy um, the value of a field, for example, story points into a field called original story points. And uh, they'll do it for other things because they want to keep um, the latest or the original estimate and stuff like that, just to compare how things have kind of progressed. Um, because we work with Jira, we're kind of, we interface with the Jira database. So when changes are made to Jira, we show the latest version, uh, both in easy agile programs and in, in structure. Uh, there are ways to get snapshots, um, both of structure data and I, I think as well of, of easy agile program data. Um, you can export structure to an Excel, for example, and timestamp it that way. Um, but because of the limitation inherently in Jira, it's kind of tricky to, to keep track of them. So a lot of people will have to go outside of Jira to kind of make those snapshots and then compare them. 
Uh, we have another question from Rizwan. How well the tools handle changes to dependencies once sprints are in flight? Is there a change log slash history of dependencies to track team dependencies? So you can, uh... yeah. yeah, I'll take this one. This is kind of goes back to the, the last question that I helped answer um, in terms of that change log. So there, we, we don't expose the changes made um, to dependencies in Easy Agile programs. If the, what kind of wasn't shown in, in the demo today was moving, uh, rescheduling issues will update the color of the dependency lines to show whether that changes the kind of um, the health of that dependency, whether it becomes blocked, um, kind of a risk or whether it becomes healthy. That's kind of the only uh, change, visual change cue that we show. Um, but in terms of exposing who cha um who rescheduled something, whether it affected a dependency color and whether that was a good or a negative thing, we don't expose. But again, um, a really interesting point and something that we could expose better. Uh, Alexander wants to know, what if you use an Epic as a planning item for multiple teams, which does not have a sprint as a field? How can you represent this in the program board and later on in structure? So I can take that, that first part. Um, in Easy Agile programs, you can't actually schedule an EPIC into any of the program sprints. Um, an EPIC is something that would have to be on the, the, feet, the roadmap. Um, and then you would have associated stories, subtasks, bugs um, that would link up to the EPIC. So there's kind of a limitation um, there, at least for programs on that front. Uh, yeah, and to build off of that, um, so, the one thing you can do is, is what we've seen is that an Epic has stories from multiple teams under it and um, structure can allow you to, for example, group them. So you can extend the Epic with the stories under it and then group them by their individual teams to organize them that way. Um, so you have functionality to do that information, but it's kind of um, going outside of the, the, the way JIRA is meant to be used, so to speak. Um, it, you, so like I said, you can do it, but it's kind of not recommended because you're kind of going outside the regular workflow and then other things kind of won't work nicely uh, and tie into that. Okay, and the next question is probably more for Phil. How do you connect Gantt scheduling and sprints with resources? Is it connected to Easy Agile? So the Gantt scheduling um, is connected to sprints by um, well, actually by a checkbox. Simply put, you can actually say, I want the, the dependencies, or sorry, the, the tasks to be scheduled based on their sprints. And then um, the Gantt chart will grab the sprint information when they're scheduled and place them in that particular time frame. Uh, if you turn that off, you can obviously place them where the dependencies dictate that they should go and use that kind of as a guiding um, way to place them correctly. So. You can go both ways. Uh, and then as to the uh, resources, Gantt resources are, are strictly on the Gantt chart right now. You point the resources to a particular field or attribute, so they don't need to be a signee necessarily. Um, you can point them to a team field or anything like that. And then they'll show up under it based on the calculations in the Gantt chart. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is no direct connection to any of the planning in easy agile short of the actual assigning it to a different sprint. But that's, again, just representing the JIRA data in two different ways. Great. Is there a way to get information from development tools and structure, say the feature was released in Bitbucket or Bamboo? Uh, yeah, so the, as I mentioned, the structure testee can connect to the API, whether it's Bamboo or Bitbucket, or if you want to connect it to Jenkins or, or something else. Um, you can connect the API on the back end that way. Um, we have documentation that I'd be happy to send over your way to kind of serve as an example of how to do that. And then the statuses will be connected to different results from the builds. Can you configure which JIRA link types are used in Easy Agile so that you can tell structure what to display based on those? So, yeah, so there's two kind of link types that we're um, that we can talk about in terms of easy agile programs. There's the 
the roadmap item to the, the issues scheduled beneath it in the sprints. Um, and then there's also the, 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 the issue links to represent dependencies. So for the first one, for the roadmap to the issues that are scheduled um, within sprints below it, definitely. Um, if you are scheduling just epics onto your roadmap, we use the standard epic uh, link. If you've chosen to use any other custom issue type um, on your roadmap, then we ask you how you'd like uh, those issues to be linked to the stories below it via an issue link. So yeah, you can select um, how you'd like the relationship to be displayed in JIRA. And if we're looking at the dependencies as well, so by default, we set the blocks is blocked by, um, but that can be configured to any other kind of standard JIRA link type, or if you've created any custom link types as well, you can definitely customize, um, customize that. Uh, another question for you, Tegan, is there a way to automatically add an average velocity to the sprints you plan? So I mentioned this a, a little quickly, maybe when I went through the presentation, currently there's not. So it's uh, an inline, you're inline editing your velocity kind of manually. We do have the intentions though of pulling in the historical velocity from the team's agile board. Um, but today, unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, another question from Alexander. When creating dependencies, does the tool use the links has to be done after or before? For example, if a link has an item from iteration one to another item from iteration three, would it make a dependency such as item two has to be done after item one? Okay, so the way that the dependency relationships work in Easy Agile programs is through drag and drop. Um, basically selecting an issue, so we say issue A, and dropping it onto issue B in another team says issue A depends on issue B. Therefore, issue B must be completed before issue A. Um, it's kind of confusing when you're talking through it, but we've also uh, made sure that the dependency lines, if they, if they happen at the start, if the circle comes off the start of a card, that's saying that that issue is the dependent issue. Um, so the, the lines go from the start to the end of cards, trying to represent that relationship as well. It's probably, I hope I explained that if I didn't, please submit another question and I'd be happy to try and clear that up again. Okay. Um, another question for you, Tegan, is there, is there a time timeline limit in Easy Agile? Say you can plan 10 weeks ahead and no more. Okay, so this is um, kind of a timely question considering that we've just, uh, we've just released a new version of Easy Agile programs that gives users more flexibility around how long a program increment that they define is. So we, um, the sprint length options can be from one to four weeks. And the number of sprints, uh, I believe, can be anywhere between um, five and 12. So you're potentially, you could um, plan like six months in advance, I guess. I wouldn't recommend that, um, but they're the kind of two options. One, two, three or four week length sprints and between four to 12 sprints in an increment. Great. Uh, another question for you, Tegan. Is Easy Agile programs avail available for Jira Cloud? If not, are there any plans for that? Not currently available on Jira Cloud. Um, it's only available on server and data center, but we would like to get uh, a, a cloud solution to market, hopefully before the end of this year. Uh, what would be the best practice to keep track of past PIs in Structure or Easy Agile? Tegan, I'd like to let you answer that one first. Okay. Um, I guess kind of best practice in terms of what you can visualize for previous PIs in programs, they appear on... Um, so you have a, what we call a program roadmap and your program roadmap will show you the increment time boxes for as far back into the future or as far forward into the future as, 
as you've planned. Um, in in those previous, so that the completed PIs, you'll be able to see a historical view um, of of the sprints and what was what was completed and what wasn't. Um, in terms of maybe a, a reporting aspect, I'm not sure whether this question is alluding to something like that. That'd be much better suited in um, structure, as we don't kind of provide any any kind of snapshot on on how the PI did. Um, rather, this is this is what we've planned, and and this is how we're we're progressing through. It's probably not the what you wanted to hear totally, but I guess this is probably where structure shines. That's probably also a little bit why I wanted to let you go first. Um, but there are two actual there are two answers to that. Um, in terms of um, keeping track of past PIs, there are two ways you can put them in structure. Um, one is part of a, a larger whole. So the PIs are obviously um, part of a, an agile release train and they build up to solutions which are part of initiatives and you can go all the way up to strategies. And um, if they are part of an active strategy or, or anything that, that you're currently still looking at, um, you can still have them in your big picture on structure. So even if they're finished and completed, you can visualize them and, and keep them visible and have them there. And um, because they're still relevant in that sense because they have accomplishments and they have work that has been logged that rolls up into the, the total progress of something else. Um, the second answer to that is when you look at it as a standalone. Um, and what we see is that oftentimes people will make a different structure purely for the program increment and they will keep track of the sprints inside that and then when it's done they will keep the structure uh, and oftentimes they'll archive it. You can actually archive structure as much in the way that you can archive Jira issues. And um, this is actually a great way to tease something that we've been working on as well, because these past information inside these program increments uh, would be a great way to kind of use, um, to kind of see how your teams have been performing, um, what their cadence is, how uh, consistent they are across multiple PIs. And we've developed a tool that we were, we kind of soft launched at Summit a few months ago and that we did a webinar on previously. So if you're interested in what I'm about to say, uh, I encourage you to look that up. Um, but it'll allow you to take past data from your teams and look at how they would potentially perform going into the future. And you can use this for things that are um, not yet fully groomed. So you can actually assign epics before they've been broken down into stories and see potentially how this will affect the roadmap. Um, so as I said, that's something we did a webinar on previously. So I highly encourage you to look into that if that's something that tickles your fancy. Uh, here's a question for you, Tegan. Is there a way to export the data in a nice and fancy way from Easy Agile to show stakeholders who live outside of JIRA? Yes, yeah, so not currently, but we do, um, we have been asked whether we can provide a PDF um, export, particularly of the increment overview. Um, so the, the overview of all of the teams within the program across the sprints within the uh, program and the dependencies. So not yet. Um, I'd be interested to see what formats you'd be thinking of and also where those people who live outside of JIRA um, where they would kind of digest that information. Is it via email? Is it in Confluence? Um, still kind of investigating what the best way to move forward with that is. All right, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have for today. Um, if we missed any questions that we didn't answer live, we'll be sending you an email with the answer. Um, thank you for everyone who has submitted during the session. All right, thank you everyone. We'd like to just quickly give you a roundup of the two different uh, products and companies that we covered today. Um, so, Tegan? Yeah, so I mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of the session that I do have an Australian accent. <laughs> All of the Easy Agile um, team is based in Australia at the moment. We're in a kind of coastal regional town called Wollongong, which is about an hour and a half south of Sydney on Australia's East Coast. We're a team of 11 and we support over 1900 different companies uh, around the world. And, and here are some of them on the screen. So 
that's kind of a really short wrap up of us. And if you're interested, you can head to our website and check out a little bit more about who we are and, and what we do. Awesome. Uh, and so as I'm hopefully everyone or most of you will know, um, so we make um, structure and the structure family of products. Uh, I hinted at um, today that we use some of the extensions for structure, the, the Gantt extension, the pages extension to, to pull in the confluence pages and the testy extension to, to add the test things. Um, we're based in Boston and in St. Petersburg. We, we have over 4,000, I believe over 5,000 customers now worldwide. Um, and we, um, we're, we're obviously very keen to, to interact with any of our customers. So if you have any questions, by all means, please reach out. Um, that having been said, I'd like to leave you guys with um, two ways to, to get in touch with us. So the top link will send you to the Easy Agile Marketplace page, which should give you all the information about Easy Agile programs going forward. And you can reach out through that to Tegan and, and her team. And the bottom page will send you to a landing page uh, of ours, or sorry, the bottom link. And we'll tell you a little bit about some of the information that we have about SAFE, uh, some of our experience. And if you have any questions, by all means, feel free to reach out to us through any of our channels um, and ask us, and we'd be happy to get back to you. Um, that having been said, I'd like to thank Tegan and Alexis for joining me on this webinar and everybody else who joined in. Um, I hope you guys learned something and came away with uh, some actionable um, things to do and to look into. And um, hopefully see you guys next time.